Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Making Memories. My name is Linda McGregor. I'm the Marketing Manager at KPMG and Wood. Our Customer Experience Excellence Centre recently studied the UK market, drawing over 10,000 consumer interviews to evaluate 287 brands. In today's webinar, we will reveal the brand's lead in UK customer experience. For those of you who have read our report this year, you will notice that it highlights the importance and role of memories within an experience. So today, we'll also be taking a closer look at how you and your organisation can create memorable moments for your customers. Today's presenters are Craig Ryder, um, Customer Experience Director at KPMG Numwood, and Rob Edwards, Senior Insight Lead at KPMG Numwood. Um, we will have some time at the end for some questions, so um, on your screen you'll see um, an Ask Your Questions section, so please feel free throughout to type a question in and submit it, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, okay, and now I'll hand over to Craig. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So we're going to take you through the findings from our UK Customer Experience Excellence Study, which, as Lindsay says, has just been published. The year is recorded the title Making Memories, and the reasons for that will become clear over the next 45 minutes as we take you through the stories we found from the data. Um, for those who haven't attended one of our webinars before, just a very quick introduction recapping on uh, what Lindsay said earlier. Um, we speak to 10,000 uh, UK consumers. We talk to them about 287 brands across 10 uh, industry sectors. Um, and over the course of seven years, that has given us a huge database of uh, exactly um, where great customer experience practice is, is delivered uh, across the UK, across Australia, and in fact across the US. Uh, we're looking at adding some more territories next year. And in fact, we're also launching a business-to-business -business study, which is due to be published later on in 2016. All that means is we've got an evaluation uh, data set of over a thousand brands across those ten sectors, and over the course of time, we've developed our own six-pillar model, um, which describes excellent customer experience delivery. All of that helps us formulate customer strategy. It helps us define and understand customer journeys in great detail, and helps us prioritize improvements and transform customer experience. The six pillar model, which I know many of you will be familiar um, of, is summarized on this, on this slide. Um, very, very briefly, personalization is about the delivery of individualized attention to customers. Uh, integrity is about uh, engendering trust and being trustworthy. Resolution is how you turn a poor experience into a great one. Time and effort is about minimizing effort and friction for the customer. Expectations is about how you manage and understand and deliver against expectations and how they're formed. And empathy is about reacting to how customers feel at an emotional level such that you build rapport with those customers uh, in the long term. Let's look at this year then. As we said, we, we looked at uh, the views of 10,000 customers. We covered uh, 287 brands. And you can see on the right of the slide the sectors we um, analyzed uh, with that customer data set. So what's going on in the UK customer experience world? Well, for the first time in three years, we saw a very um, positive movement uh, in, in our overall level of performance compared to, to, to previous years. The UK achieved a 1% improvement across those brands compared to what we'd seen previously. Um, that was after a very, very flat three years. And in fact, we're now um, uh, almost uh, at the same level of customer experience delivery um, as uh, we're seeing in the U.S. For some years, we've been a little way behind the U.S. We're now seeing that gap halved this year, um, I guess, which is great news for the marketplace. Where's that impressive growth coming from then? So um, we've always seen a champion really good performance. Uh, we, we always saw 10, 15 brands pulling away from the, um, from the, uh, from the rest, so to speak. And what this chart shows now is the, the distribution of performance for the UK this year, which is the green line, versus last year, which is the blue line. So we start on the right-hand side, which are the less well-performing brands. And you can see that it's in this bottom half of the table where the most progress has been made by those, um, those brands. Look on the left-hand side of the table where the better performing brands are, and we can see relatively little movement. So we talk about that Champions League. Where the chart uh, kicks up on the left-hand side, you can see there's actually very, very little movement at all there. 
So the brands at the very top are finding it difficult to move forward, and the real progress appears to be being made lower down the league. Within this general partner performance, it's clear that um, there are some categories, some industries that are doing better than others. So this chart lists those 10 industries with the best performing um, sector up at the top and the less well performing sector down below. We can see that grocery retail leads the way, um, as they have done since we've been doing this work over the last six, seven years. Um, and they managed an improvement we see of 1% compared to where they came in last year. And actually, much of that improvement has been delivered by uh, some of the more premium brands, Cardo, M&S, and Waitrose, who have built their reputation even from last year. This is counted to an extent by the discount sector, where um, they're much in the news. They're, they have been doing very, very well recently. We're just starting to see some evidence that those busier stores have started to create some um, custom experience challenges, um, which uh, over time may well prove to be uh, an issue for those brands. I guess the real news, however, lies at the bottom of this chart. So if you look at um, the purple uh, bar and the um, orange bar, we can see two traditionally um, uh, sectors who've had a difficult time delivering customer experience really starting their act together. So we can see a 3% increase um, from the telecom sector and a 4% increase from the utility sector. Both of those industries are similar in that it tends to be a long contract-based um, uh, customer experience. And we're now starting to see some of the more successful brands take a really new look at customer experience and start to understand the, the value in having a happy customer for a lifetime. We're starting to see some of those brands really break out of that lower quartile to do a great job for the customer. So this is this year's top 10, and we can see some very familiar brands in there, but there are some notable new entries. So first direct, we gained the first spot, uh, with John Lewis and Lush uh, very, very close behind. Um, we've talked about those brands a lot in the past. They continue to be uh, the very, very best in their sectors, delivering some very innovative approaches to customer experience. And I think what's important to say is these brands are always improving. They're always making incremental improvements to what is an already a fantastic uh, experience delivery operation they have. I guess a particular note this year, we've got Emirates and, and Gifta. Um, um, all of those brands in the top 10 deliver excellence in, in a very different way. So, so there's no textbook to deliver great excellence. At the absolute heart of delivery is understanding your place in the market, understanding your customers and what they want from that customer experience. So Emirates have really started to build on focusing um, an empathic layer to their customer experience, which traditionally has been very, very good but often delivered by some of the very best hard products. So they're working hard to deliver an empathic layer to their brand experience. And in fact, Rob will talk about that a little later in the presentation. Gift gas, obviously, in the telecoms industry have a very unique um, uh, proposition. Um, the support is driven by the user community. And um, what they understood very early on was that the moment you get away from long contracts, then uh, it puts your customers in a much happier place. So they operate a, a rolling four-week contract, um, and that is a very, very, uh, in that industry, it's a very, very um, uh, different product compared to what many, many traditional operators are still offering. What's clear when we read customer feedback? So every one of these brands, we have a, a large database of, of what, what I like to call customer narrative. So it's, it's why customers think a brand is good, bad, or indifferent, and what particular action, what particular moment was it that triggered um, uh, a brand to attract that kind of uh, score or, or, or rating. What's very clear when we read those customer narratives is that um, delivering memorable experiences is at the heart of success. So whenever we look at the top 30 or 40 brands, Memorable experiences are at the heart of people giving those brands great scores, great rankings. Um, and the art of understanding how we deliver memorable experience is increasingly at the heart of what uh, great customer experience management is. So 
we often get asked um, when we we're talking to people in the marketplace why um, why chase customer experience? What what is the value in customer experience? So there are many academic papers in circulation that support the idea that building customer experience is, is ultimately beneficial. Um, but this chart very, very quickly summarizes the benefits. And we've split them into first and, and, and second order benefits. So as customer satisfaction, as customer happiness, as, as, as customer information to advocate the brand increases, um, we can see that uh, customers are more likely to, to, to do all of the things listed under that first order column. So they're more likely to buy again without thinking twice. They're more likely to buy associated products that the organization offers. Um, they are less sensitive to price. We're going to see a chart uh, very soon about, uh, that illustrates that. And they're more likely to talk to friends, family, acquaintances um, about what a great experience um, Brand X offers. And of course, in the social media powered world, um, positive word of mouth is something that is very, very desirable and is actually where the emotional conversation tends to take place these days. So looking at the next slide, this is um, an example from a telecoms industry where we've got two brands. The brand on the left hand side has a slightly more um, or a considerably more favorable customer experience score than the brand on the right. And first of all, what it shows you is the higher your experience score grows, the faster it grows, then the more likely you are to hang on to your customers. So that's the difference between the solid lines and the dotted lines. But I think even more importantly, um, where we increase the price of the products, um, which is the upright left-hand axis, um, we can see that for a brand with a better customer experience score, they lose far fewer customers with that price increase. And in fact, the poorer performing brand on the right will lose twice as many customers as the better performing brand on the left. So what we know is customer experience creates a far less price sensitive customer, which ultimately is, is a very positive, profitable position to be in. So, having spent a lot of time um, talking to clients, talking to uh, organizations in the marketplace around customer experience, we can see a few trends starting to emerge in how customer experience is, is, is delivered as a strategic component of their proposition. The first thing we're seeing is a real focus on what you might call the spine of the organization. So this is the understanding that culture ultimately impacts the employee experience. That ultimately impacts um, uh, how the employee behaves. That is very, very closely linked to how customer experience is delivered on the front line. And of course, we know that if customer experience is delivered well, then customers will behave in a way that's very positive, i.e. they will remain loyal and they will potentially become advocates for the brand in the marketplace. So we call that the spine of the organization and we're seeing businesses increasingly starting to trace customer experience, not only forward into customer behaviors, but back into how what they do, how they treat their customers, how that ultimately affects how employees deliver experience. So that's a trend that we're starting to see um, uh, organizations follow. We're also starting to see um, uh, organizations come to the conclusion that whilst providing surprise and delight is, is generally a good thing, um, it doesn't matter if the background processes and the rules and processes that are in place um, aren't also contributing to, to a positive customer experience. So in less competitive times, surprise and delight was often at the heart of organizations that were seen to be doing a good job. Um, we're increasingly seeing those background processes have to be aligned to allowing the frontline employee to deliver um, that surprise and delight against the backdrop of smooth process. Ultimately, process must not get in the way of delivering that emotional high during the customer experience. Our third uh, um, observation is that the customer journey is now becoming the, the important unit of how organizations design themselves and how they understand customer experience. So when customer experience was, a, I guess, a new science seven, eight, ten years ago, we saw a big focus on the touch points. So there was, a, there was a view across many organizations that 
if you get the touch points right, then positive customer experience, positive customer behaviors will follow. But having spent many years talking to um, customers about what they want out of customer experiences, it's clear that customers talk in, in journeys, customers talk in missions. They don't just talk um, with, with a sort of glowing point of view about specific touch points. It's about how all the experience comes together. So organizations are increasingly seeing that it's the journey that matters as opposed to the individual components alone. And then finally, um, we're 100 days post-Brexit vote, and we're seeing some very different approaches to customer experience in organizations. The Brexit vote took a lot of people by surprise, I think made a lot of organizations nervous. And we've seen uh, businesses already far more demanding of, of the customer experience investment business case, I guess. They're looking long and hard at return on investments. And what that's leading, actually, is to a far more segmented and targeted approach to, to delivering customer experience transformation. It's increasingly important to understand your target customer and understand what that specific target customer is looking for from your organization. I think the, the idea of organizations being all things to all people is becoming increasingly um, um, uh, problematic because it doesn't lend itself to targeted customer experiences with the power to bring the customer back. So that's what we've seen in the marketplace. We've talked a lot about creating memorable experiences. I'm going to hand over now to um, my colleague Rob Edwards, who's going to explain some of the psychology about understanding what memorable experiences need to be. Um, so Rob, hand over to you now. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so yeah, the 2016 report is called Making Memories, and in this next section we're going to look about how memories are created. We're also going to look at how organizations have developed specific initiatives and overall cultures which lead to memorable experiences, look at some examples, and give you some principles to think about yourselves. But before we look at that, we're going to look at, like Craig says, the psychology of uh, memories. Obviously a huge area, and um, so we've just got a summary here of uh, what we find to be important elements. The memory processing part of the brain is located in the emotional center. This is connected to future forecasting part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. It is these connections that govern our behavior. So when information is determined to have a long-term value, it's very much an emotional connection. I'm sure we're all aware of the left and right brain uh, terminology, the rational versus the uh, creative or emotional. And that could assume through that 50-50 split that the brain is 50-50 governed. But actually, the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio asserts that the emotional tail wags the rational dog. It's very much an assumption that 95% of actions are unconscious and the event processing part of the brain only has a minimal impact. So why is that? Well, the configuration of the brain means that we tend to store memories that are emotional content far more deeply than those that are not. They're also among our strongest and easiest to recall, those memories with a strong emotional content. So a fundamental question about human memory is why some experiences are remembered with others are forgotten. So we've looked through all the neuroscience and the, the psychology behind the brain and we've determined that an event is likely to become a memory or an experience is likely to become a memory if it's got high emotional value or if it's personally meaningful or if it's novel or unexpected or a combination of those. A surprise birthday party, for instance, uh, would have all three of those, and I'm sure would lead to a lasting memory, good or bad. And um, when we look at that high emotional value, we can talk about positive and negative emotions. Now, negative emotions are assumed to have six times more power, more memorable than a positive. What this means in practice, it's been speculated that you need 12 positive memories to overcome one negative memory. This is particularly important in the delivery of customer experience. This means sharp focus has to be on consistently excellent delivery. If you give someone a bad experience, 
you're going to have to work very hard to turn them back around. And then we look at the memory of the event. This memory is actually more determining of future behaviour than the event itself. Neuroscientist Daniel Kahneman asserts that when we talk about the future and what we imagine the future to be, what we're actually imagining is the memory of the event in the future. So determining, understanding and creating these emotionally powerful memories are going to be extremely valuable for companies in the future. When we look at the actual uh, journey through an experience, and we think about then all that content that builds into our memory making capability, we look at three distinct stages called the serial position effect. So we've got the first impression, the emotional peak, and the last impression. Now the first impression is linked to that psychological law of primacy, where that initial uh, contact or experience primes our perception uh, for the following interactions. Some brands who do this particularly well are Santander with a red carpet welcome, British Airways has got a clear focus on greeting and the captain comes out and says hello to the passengers, um, and TSB, and we'll talk about TSB in a second. Um, but these, these are people who have realized that a great first impression creates an environment where those future memories can be stored. If we look at the emotional peak, each interaction has got an emotional peak, and those emotions come in three broad areas. The customer is already emotional, it's, a, it's a, an exciting purchase or something like that. The customer can be made to feel emotional by our interactions um, through uh, interacting with the staff and making them feel special about a particular moment. Or the emotional peak comes from a negative place. There wasn't supposed to be any emotion and something's happened during the journey which has created an emotion. Now, some Clearly, uh, brands who have made this work really well for them are Emirates, who we're going to talk about in a second, uh, Marriott, learning from the Ritz-Carlton uh, model, and um, Nationwide. Nationwide is providing the hamper for the new mortgage customers of their new home, for instance, which creates this kind of warmth and this emotional piece around that, that interaction. Um, so what we've got there is brands which are looking at both intangible and tangible uh, emotional peaks. So the intangible is about creating the correct emotion that the customer needs to feel at that time. And that could be understanding the urgency of a situation, or being sympathetic, or understanding, or being empathetic. It's about understanding exactly at what stage uh, they're at, and reacting accordingly. So Rick Carlton, who I referenced earlier, they are absolute craftsmen at doing this. So they've charged all their employees with being what they call memory makers, and everyone from uh, the room service staff through to the frontline reception staff um, through to the cleaners have been trained on customer interaction and how to talk and deal with customers. And in effect, that they've got a team of 40,000 people there creating uh, good memories. Then we look at something like tangible, so like the nationwide providing the hamper. Um, you've also got the now famous warm cookies given out by the Double Tree Hilton. Um, and you've got Emirates, who we're going to talk about in a second, using their uh, photographs to capture in-flight moments. So that's the emotional peak. Um, and then we get to the last impression. The last impression is about making the customer feel good and leaving them with a positive memory. Um, the small touches demonstrate empathy with the customer and leave them with that warm feeling towards the brand, ensuring their memory is positive. Um, it's, it's simple things like using the customer's name, summarizing what's been achieved today between, between the brand and the customer, um, maybe meeting expectations as to what's going to happen next, a warm goodbye, all those sort of things. Um, and first direct are someone who stands out as doing this. Um, and I'll talk about those in a second. So if we look at uh, some brands who've done this well, take first position for a start. We'll look at TSB. When you walk into the TSB, as soon as you enter the branch, a staff member comes up to you straight away with a big smile on their face and a willingness to assist. What you've also got with TSB, though, um, is elements that have been going on in the background, if you like. And this is something that we found and it's something that Craig referenced earlier with the spine of the organization. 
when we talked to the distribution director at PSB, um, he referenced the fact that they've done a lot of work on their single distribution function behind the scenes. Um, the partners, their employees, sorry, are, are called partners. Um, they've revamped their, their variable pay mechanism. Um, and then you assign all that uh, that's going on in the background, if you like, with the warm welcome up front. And what you have is the two elements working uh, sympathetically with each other. So you've got a member of the branch staff who can do the warm welcome, and when it comes to processing a transaction, the systems all work to benefit. And that's why we've seen them move 85 places up the chart this year. If we look at uh, the next position, which is that emotional peak position I talked about, we can reference Emirates. Now, Emirates um, have for a long time been uh, you know, excellent deliveries of customer, uh, customer excellence. A recent initiative has seen them do the uh, like a Polaroid capture of the in-flight. So they'll target uh, certain people like families and uh, maybe someone going on their first flight. Um, and they'll really basically make a fuss of them. So they'll take a picture of them on, on the flight and they'll provide them with a photograph afterwards. So that is a physical capture of a memory. Um, I remember years ago, and I don't know if they still do it, but when my children went to get their first shoes from Clark's, um, they used to take a Polaroid picture of the first shoes and they put it in a little cardboard wallet which had first shoes on the front. And it is something we kept and it is something we look at. And when we look at that, we remember that day and we remember the excitement and the whole the whole emotion around that. So that physical capturing of a, of a memory can be extremely powerful. If we then move on to look at that last position, or last impression, sorry. I referenced First Direct earlier. Again, we've talked about First Direct for many different reasons uh, in the past. To me, these are also an example of where you get the support functionality and the frontline functionality working together, you create a seamless customer experience, or you certainly allow the customer experience to be as seamless as possible. So what First Direct have been working on with the mother band HSBC are the voice interaction system, the voice ID print, uh, or the biometric security. Trying to get rid of layers of complexity which will allow transactions to be much more smooth. Align that then with well-trained staff, and we've referenced in the past the first direct uh, approach to, to recruitment and the, the types of personalities they go for. And when we think about this last impression, this is something which is relatively easy to do by changing the script around, so their interaction ends on a positive rather than on a negative word. So rather than saying, have I done everything you need today? Uh, sorry, rather than saying, um, uh, is there anything else I can do for you, which a lot of people say, um, which leads to a no answer. Um, they said, have I done anything you need today, which leads to a yes answer. So a simple change in script can allow uh, a, a much, you know, a change in the, the final word, which is a change in emotion and a, a lack in memory. So finally, from me, when we look about how do we put all that into practice, what we need to be able to do is look at what the best people in the market are doing to make best use of memories and uh, use them to their advantage. So what we see now is a co-creation process, an experience that is memorable and anchored around an emotion or change or novelty or is personally meaningful like we talked about, but it's being co-created with the customer, it's not just being pushed on them. So we've got Rick Carlton again, for instance, offering to invent a drink in, in your honour or allowing, saying we'll show you the view from the 110th floor, or saying you know, we're going to, you're going to be captain of the ship for a day or whatever. It's these big memories that are co-created together. And then we've got the capture and curate. People are increasingly curating their own lives. Social media is about curating your life online. So Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, there are all ways in which we present a view of ourselves and prevent, present a view of our lives. And this is where we see a real power in that capture moment, the Polaroid on the, on the ship, on the Emirates flight, for instance. You know, you can imagine a, a scenario where the, the new house purchaser purchased, uh, posts a picture of themselves moving into their new house with big smiley faces and the, and the welcome box in front of them. It's that idea where we charge the customer with 
providing our our content for our for our brand. Social media is an absolute hotspot for doing this, and particularly then the sharing. So what we've got is the ability to share across thousands, millions of people a positive memory, a positive emotion um, that can be shared through that conversation. It is played out publicly, um, which is both good and bad. You know, those good experiences will will live forever, and then the bad ones are, of course, social media allows people to vent and rant and you know do their negative emotions as well. But again, you've got the ability to turn that around with the with the positive memory if you can re-implant that for a better experience. So I think what we've seen there is a very quick overview of what makes a memory and very much embedded in the emotion, personal or meaningful, or make it novel. And then some initiatives around how people are going about co-creation. And this is possibly something for you to think about. How do we, as our brands and, and what we do, where can we make a co-creation possible? Where can we make a capture possible? Where can we help people curate? You might have your own online uh, social media presence which you would uh, allow people to upload to. Uh, Transparent um, Trains, for instance, have got their own Twitter account. And they regularly ask people to send the, you know, their favorite picture from the train, uh, their favorite view from the train window, for instance. Um, so where can you, as brands, uh, attempt to do that capturing curate? and then share those positive memories around. Thank you, Rob. So we've got a good understanding there of how to create memorable experiences. And it's clear that memorable experiences are at the heart of transforming an organization from, from good to great in terms of delivering customer experience. So I guess that tees up the question, is transformation possible? And over the seven years we've been running this study in the UK, Having spoken to, I guess in the UK alone, upwards of 50,000 consumers now, there are um, several brands who have clearly uh, hugely transformed what they do, even in that relatively short timeline. So what this slide shows are the brands who, over the course of the time frame, have delivered um, an improvement of 100 ranked places. And we can see there that uh, they're mainly uh, financial services brands, so Barclays, Direct Line, Travelodge, Saga um, have uh, our financial services or, or predominantly financial services brand, and then we've got Travelodge in there as well. Um, and I guess the good news here is that we've got some long-established brands here who have uh, delivered customer experience transformation um, uh, despite any legacy issues they have, despite any legacy infrastructure. So um, this isn't just about new brands uh, starting with a, uh, with a clear piece of paper, I guess. Um, Long-term brands can, can deliver transformation, and, and this chart is the proof of that. Um, Rob's talked about TSB already, and we can see that they, uh, they are now uh, number 35 in our uh, ranking, and that's up 85 places compared to last year. And from Rob's case study, we can see that Actually, they've done a lot of things, but I think at the heart of what they've done is a joined up plan. So they've looked at back office, they've looked at um, uh, how they uh, recruit and how they incentivize colleagues, and they've created a new way of delivering experience on the front line. All of those things are pulling in the same direction, um, and it's very, very clear that their customers have seen a transformed experience for that brand. So. Picking up on the transformation theme, our final few slides are um, our views on how um, transformation can be delivered uh, in the customer experience arena. So what we have here, if you look at the triangle on the left, it's a sequence of transformation using our six pillar framework as a, as a guideline. The six pillars describe a great customer experience. And what's been clear to us over time is that um, brands cannot pick and choose pillars to deliver. You have to be, uh, you have to deliver each pillar very, very well to get into the top 20, top 30 brands in our city. But when you're looking at making big changes, when you're looking at transforming customer experience, there's a very, very clear sequence that pillars should be tackled. So th this is adapted, I guess, from from Maslow's hierarchy, um, and we can see that down at the bottom. The first pillar that must be dealt with um, is, is integrity. Integrity and resolution, in fact, tend to be at the heart of customer narratives 
um, attached to unhappiness, attached to customers giving brands very, very low scores. So fundamentally, if a customer doesn't trust the brand or they've had a bad resolution experience, then they're not just neutral, they're not just unhappy, they are deeply dissatisfied with the brand. And they're likely to tell that story um, at every opportunity. That, 15 years ago, that was in the pub on the phone to friends. It's now on Twitter, it's now on social media, and those stories are out there and around the world uh, very rapidly if, if you're unlucky as a brand. So understanding what integrity means to your customers in relation to your business is the first thing to, to, to look hard at when it comes to transforming uh, your organization or your organization's experience and delivery. If we then look at uh, the expectations component, once you've got the basics of resolution integrity in place, I guess you've headed off very, very problematic um, um, customer narratives. Um, and then uh, once you start to understand your customer's expectations of your brand, understand their expectations of, of the marketplace and competitors, that's the point at which you can then start to fuel transformation. Um, the individual components of that understanding start to give you the ability to build something new and impressive, um, having satisfied yourself that those resolution and integrity issues are no longer um, a problem for the organization. Right at the top of the chart, um, it's clear again, looking through customer narratives, when they tell us their stories, that empathy and personalization are at the heart of, of, of of brand love, I guess. So those customers who who are giving brands 10s, 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, and who tell the world about how much they love a brand, it invariably comes back to a, a story where an interaction or several interactions have been empathic in nature. Those interactions have been very highly personalized, they've focused on the customer's specific needs, and where you can deliver that with an empathic interaction, that becomes uh, very, very um, uh, powerful in turning um, customers into fans, which ultimately is what we're looking for. If you look at uh, stories about resolution, there's a there's a level of mechanical resolution, uh, resolution where you just give the customer the money back, for example, in retail. But if you can do that in a way that starts to address how the customer's feeling in an empathic fashion, then that's when customers um, see that recovery as heroic and turn around from being a brand detractor to, to a brand promoter. So empathy is the most powerful tool in delivering um, high scoring customer experiences again and again. We're also seeing organizational structure playing an increasing role in how customer experience um, is, is, is delivered in that organization. So what we see here are it's a continuum of structures. Um, going back uh, many years, most organizations were silo-driven. And we can see there that the, the customer components tended to come in at a relatively um, uh, uh, unpredictable level. So in, in, in silo one, the customer angle might have been represented um, uh, down at the bottom end of the um, hierarchy. In silo eight, uh, it came in at the top of the hierarchy, but there was no common view of the customer. The customer wasn't handled at any particular level of the organization. And in those siloed worlds, um, of course, um, the, the silo leaders delivered what was right for the silo and not necessarily right for the customers. In the past 10, 15 years, we're seeing more and more matrix organizations where, um, again, the organization is functionally structured, um, but the customer is represented at a relatively common level, which compared to the old silo format was, was a very, very positive step forward. That meant, for example, a customer working group consisting of senior managers um, met on a regular basis. A great step forward. However, the, the representatives of those working groups still have to go back to those um, individual functional heads and convince them that this action, which was really which was clearly right for the customer, was also right for the organization. So the matrix organization, which is the most common organization we still see out there, um, is undoubtedly a step forward, um, but they're still, potentially, the customer is not at the forefront of decision-making. 
We're just starting to see uh, in the States and in some real cutting edge organizations the idea of a radial structure. What happens here is that the customer journey, the interests of the customer are absolutely at the heart of the organization. And functional specialists feed into those um, uh, customer journey redesigns, customer journey transformations. But ultimately, the final decision is made by the person who owns the customer journey, as opposed to the head of the function deciding that it's right for for his day-to-day -day, um, organizational needs. So it's a very bold move, and it does lend itself to organizations who are starting with a blank piece of paper. But we do see the regular organization, the organization structured around customer journeys or a customer agenda as being the future. And it's it's a bold move, but you know we do see again that leading and driving another ramping up in how customer experience is delivered. And of course, the minute one organisation in your marketplace does that, then um, your competitive sets have to move quickly. Uh, otherwise, a big gap appears. So, our final slide then is um, okay. How do you deliver um, a great customer experience on the front line? And um, we, uh, Rob talked earlier about Ritz Carlton and the fact that they call their employees memory makers, and um, we think that's a great title. We've, we've, we've stolen that title, I guess, for this slide, which gives us a basic set of rules um, that need to be in place to deliver customer experience perfection on the front line. And it starts with recruitment. So um, we see the need for organizations to recruit uh, frontline employees who are naturally empathic. Um, empathy wasn't often a recruitment decision driver. Um, uh, organizationally, we tend to be focused on recruiting for skill as opposed to recruiting for attitude and style. But actually, for most frontline employees, the skills can be rapidly taught. And actually, again, looking at customer narratives, it's that empathic interaction that creates fans as opposed to just customers. So the people who recruit need to be empathic. If they've got frontline roles, they need to be naturally sociable. They need to want to look up rather than look down. They need to be people who are happier dealing with real people rather than happier dealing with paperwork. It also helps if you can um, recruit sector enthusiasm. Brands um, like Richard Sands and Lush, um, uh, their recruitment process is very much built around uh, getting people on board who know the product, who are enthusiastic about the product, and want to impart their knowledge. So recruitment is less and less about existing skills and experience, and more and more about ticking those three boxes. Once you've recruited um, uh, employees into the organization, you need to get your, your structure, how their day-to-day -day plays out right. That's about providing tools. So Rob mentioned earlier the importance of the backroom process, and empathic interaction um, can be fantastic, but if your frontline employee is having to deal with tools that just don't lend themselves to the task, then that becomes, um, that becomes a very mixed customer experience. Again, customers talk in journey. If they order a, a click and collect product, the interaction can be great, but actually what they want to do is walk away with that product as quickly as possible. So if the tools in the background, if the processes in the background aren't in place, then it's very, very difficult to deliver a great customer journey. Secondly, the concept of, of what a good job looks like. Does your organization provide to its people a view of what it is they're trying to achieve. And it's surprising how many organizations this doesn't happen in. Um, but providing that what a good job looks like um, uh, tool or, uh, or image or one page description, um, again, is another step forward in telling your people what it is they actually have to achieve on the front line. And then finally, and linked to that first point, is the removal of, of, of petty rules. Organizations that tend to be structured in silos can have a, a, a mass of rules that, when they were first put in place, made enormous sense to the people who put them in place. But over time, those rules overlap, they build up, and over time, those rules can lead to a highly inefficient customer experience. 
We then need to put in place a, a permission framework. So we've got our new recruits, we've given them a structure um, and, and a hard product that allows them to deliver something that is desirable. Um, but they, they need the permission to make their own judgments. Um, they mustn't hide behind rules and processes. Um, and we also need to allow them to, to, to encourage what, what we would call heroic recovery. So where something goes wrong, the most successful organizations don't just mechanically put it right, but they, they, they deliver what we call a heroic recovery. And it has the power to turn a customer from somebody who just used the business transactionally into a real uh, organizational fan. In terms of how employees um, interact with, them, with each other as well as customers, we then need employees who seek out opportunities to deliver experience who seek out opportunities to role model the way forward for fellow employees and who are willing to share stories. Organizations that share stories about successes and failures um, um, create a great environment for um, making things happen. There's no fear of failure and again, organizations uh, and employees can, can soak up new ways of delivering great experiences. And then finally, we need to celebrate um, uh, success. We need to recognize uh, in individuals in the business who've done a good job, and we need rewards to, um, to reflect that as well. So employees who think they can progress by doing a good job um, are far more likely to deliver great experience on the front line. So I hope what we've presented today has been useful, um, and uh, we're just going to finish off before we take any questions with a, with a quote. It's a quote from Maya Angelou, um, who is a, an author I'm sure you're all aware of, and we think it fits very, very nicely with the themes that we've seen coming out of this year's uh, UK study. And, and our quote is this, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that is very, very resonant, very, very relevant for what we see um, in the customer experience arena. So I think we've got time for some questions now. Yes, we do. Thanks, Craig and Rob. That was really interesting. I'm sure a lot of listeners are thinking about their most memorable moments yeah. and, and reliving the whole experience. Um, we've had lots of questions come in, so we will try and get through as many as we can. Um, and the first question in, um, making memories is a nice thing to do. But isn't it more important to just get things right for customers? So um, I'll start with that one, Rob. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they're both important, and um, we're seeing getting things right for the customer. Um, you know, will get you into the top half of the rankings. Making memories will get you some fans. Um, uh, memories will often um, come out of you just getting things right for the customer. So the memorable piece is often the, the layer on top that takes you from good to great. Um, so from my point of view, it's important to get things right for the customer in the background. A lot of that is around process design, um, but um, creating a memorable layer on top starts to get customers who will score you 9, 10 out of 10, mm -hmm. as opposed to 7 or 8 out of 10. Yeah, I think I'd add to that by saying, re-referencing the, the pyramid we showed of the, the pillar sequence. So you get your, what we might call, hygiene factors correct first, you build up trust, you ensure you've got good resolution in place, people can do what they want to do and receive the service they expect. And then the surprise and delight which creates the positive memory is, is on top. I think we teed it up at the beginning saying people who rush to do the surprise and delight and forget about that concrete layer are setting themselves up for a fall. So you need, mm -hmm. to, you need to build that pyramid, basically. Yeah, and I guess to stay with the sequence, um, another question is coming, asking if the transformation sequence is the same for all sectors? So, yeah, certainly at the top and the bottom, um, resolution integrity are always the first things to get right. That's the, that's the platform on which you can build a transformed organization. And similarly, for all the sectors we've looked at, and, you know, you've got 10 sectors there, yeah. Empathy and personalization are absolutely at the heart of customer stories around why they love a brand. Yeah. Um, what each of those means for your customers will be very different. Mm -hmm. And it's important you understand for your organization what integrity means. You know, for, for a discount retailer, integrity is about having your products in stock at the price you advertise. Mm -hmm. For a uh, premium fashion retailer, integrity is about supporting the right charities, ensuring your 
uh, you've got a very green approach to how you trade. So, so integrity uh, revolution very, very different. All of those pillars are very, very different for each organization. And you have to understand that from a customer view as opposed to from an internal view to address those things. Yeah, I think um, as well as that, I think we're also different depending on the type of business. So I think there's a question on there someone's asked about um, digital only versus an omnichannel yeah. organization. Um, and that's even more than uh, important to understand how those pillars and how that transformation sequence is applicable. So for a digital only organization, for instance, there's obviously less human interaction, there's maybe you know, it's difficult to build that kind of empathy in, in, in a human way. Um, the challenge is bringing that warmth and that personalization online. But if you look at someone like, you know, I know we've referenced them before, you look at someone like Amazon, for instance, they've completely understood personalization and empathy in the way that they structure their sales platform. So it's possible that, like you said, it's about, you know, for a digital only organization, for instance, I would say resolution, you know, is, is different for um, a, a branch organization or a retail organization. Um, so the sequence is probably the same, but like Craig says, the type of organization you are um, probably determines how each of those are delivered differently. And I think in that predominantly digital world, it's about understanding where you do have a chance to deliver empathy. Mm. So Amazon, you know, Amazon has a call center that you occasionally have to call, mm. and you need to cherish that opportunity to deliver an empathic interaction mm. where you have it. You don't want too many of them, so you have to structure your information on, online in a way that um, minimizes that interaction. But where that interaction has to happen, that's your chance to deliver empathy. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, um, and this has come through um, a few different um, phrases. Um, I've noticed a lot of niche brands in your top 100. Mm. Don't you think that they have an advantage um, over large organisations? Um, I'll start this off. Uh, I think um, what we can learn from niche brands is they understand their customer and their customer segment acutely well. Now, yes, of course, you know, you could say they've got an advantage in having a smaller customer base, possibly with a, a more defined parameters around them. But really the principle of what they've done is they've understood that customer base and they've understood those parameters. And they've organized themselves to deliver um, specifically what that customer segment wants. So if you look at someone like Saga, who's obviously in our report and has seen a you know, meteoric rise in 2013, up over 200 places, there, I think. Um, They've organized themselves around three main areas, which is the spine of the organization we talked about before. They completely understand their customer through evolving dynamic customer insight and data and good measurement practice in place. They've empowered their employees to fully understand their segment and their market. And they've designed products which are specific for that market based on that feedback. So when you put those three things together, you get a hugely empathetic experience. Um, and that's not something that is only relevant for niche. Those are the lessons which broad market appeal organizations need to take on board and possibly have different segment plans, for instance, where they adopt those principles of knowing the customer, having employees that know the customer and understand the customer, and developing products which the customers want to buy. So, yeah, from my point of view, those niche brands um, became successful because they spotted an experienced gap in the market. So so um, all the brands in our in our survey started off as a small organization and um, uh, found a gap in the market. And uh, some of those niche brands are now big brands. You know, Richard Sounds have an awful lot of branches. They started off in a in a tiny shop on London Bridge Walk and they've now got um, many, many stores delivering an experience that is still hugely unique in the marketplace. Um, they understood their customer in minute detail what they were looking for, and they structured an organization around delivering that experience, and it's been incredibly successful. So these brands are here to stay, and whilst it might be more straightforward for those guys to deliver a very targeted customer experience, if we are operating a mainstream brand that's trying to be all things to all people, then um, those news brands will, will be around and we need to find a way of delivering something different. Okay. 
Um, I think we've got time for another question. Um, somebody's asked, if memory making is so important, how do we know what kind of memories to make? Good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think similar to the uh, the pillar uh, transformation sequence, it's going to be obviously different for each organisation. And like I said before, when I looked at the um, co-create, capture, curate, and share model, you know, each brand and each organisation has to look to themselves and say, well, what can we do in these spaces? Uh, I think I said, what opportunities can we create to capture memories and curate and, and share those memories? I think at the heart of it, and it kind of builds on from what we were saying about um, the niche brand, at the heart of it is truly understanding your customers and, and kind of understanding what makes those um, hugely empathetic and warm responses that we get to our verbatim when we, when we do our tracking, for instance, for our, for our clients. So having that strong measurement platform in place, acutely understanding kind of what drives the best customer experience in your organization by implementing um, uh, you know the relationship style trackers that we have and then the ongoing kind of interaction trackers that we run by understanding what happens at each of those stages um, you can then determine okay what it's about us when do we see those really excellent services coming through our, our results and how do we capture those and give the customer the opportunity to curate and, and share those those memories so I think it's also about looking at the CE that we've got and looking at how other people are doing it and saying, okay, they've done it and they're in our sector and some similar we can do. Um, but yeah, so it's good tracking model in place, understanding your customers, looking for good case study examples where other people have done it, um, and then looking to yourself to, to say, okay, where, where can we create this sort of memory making capability? And I think uh, I pick up there, Rob, on the, the importance of understanding the customer from the outside in. Mm. So, um, uh, letting the customer talk, letting the customer describe what they want to achieve, as opposed to, you know, testing this piece of technology or that piece of technology. It's about understanding the customer journey, it's about understanding how they describe it, it's about understanding where their faces light up when they're describing it, and um, that ultimately gives you a view of where you're heading. Um, um, as opposed to a inside out view which which can often be very process and touch mm -hmm. point oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Um, I think we're almost out of time now. So thank you both very much. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us today. I hope you found the, um, the webinar interesting and of use. Um, for those of you that haven't read the report, um, it's available to download on our website um, where you will find um, you know, a number of resources on there in terms of best practice. As, as we mentioned earlier, we have you know, kind of been doing this research for seven years now. So there is um, a, lot, a lot of learning, um, learning on the website. You've also got the opportunity to apply for um, Excellence Centre membership, um, where you receive, you know, automatic invites to webinars and to receive the latest um, thought leadership from KPMG and with etc. So please do feel free to go on and register. Um, and yes, yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.